Christian Center. I'm so glad you could join us for our online service. Happy Mother's Day, all of you mothers out there. We welcome you today. And I've got a great word for you. I'm gonna talk about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in worship. But before we get to that, we've got an online meet and greet. Can you do me a favor? Reach out to family members, friends, everyone you know, invite them to this online service. Let's get the numbers up of people that are watching our services on a weekly basis. All right, I will see you on the other side of the meet and greet. Mother's Day LMCC family and to all of you moms, I wish you the very, very best today. And as we're thinking about mothers and honoring mothers and, and um, you know, and hopefully you're planning a great day uh, with your mom, dinner and hanging out and things like that, I wanted to minister something that I thought would be fitting for Mother's Day. And, um, and so I want to continue what I was sharing last week about worship, but today I want to talk about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in worship. And if you know anything about the Holy Spirit, there's um, there are descriptions in the Old Testament and the New Testament that uh, in some ways are similar to a mom. Now, obviously, I'm not equating the Holy Spirit to a mom, but you know, the, the Old Testament, in particular in Genesis, chapter 1 in verse 2, it says this. It says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And that's interesting. The, the, the idea of, of Holy Spirit hovering connotes a sweeping or, or, or a moving rather than staying stationary. And, um, you know, word studies of this reveal that the Holy Spirit hovering uh, over the face of the deep, over the face of the waters, the uncreated earth, the uncreated cosmos, speaks of a protective hovering. Uh, it, 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 it speaks of a continued process. It carries with it the idea of the Spirit of God hovering over the uncreated earth and protecting it, but also working and moving to bring about creation. Because, of course, when we see in the rest of Genesis 1, we see God creating the, the skies and the stars and the moon and, and, and you know, all of the creatures and, and, you know, everything that inhabits in the earth, male and female, all those types of things, right? Man and woman. And, and so it carries with it the idea of the Holy Spirit works to make the earth fruitful and productive, to make the earth fit to, to, for the creation of life. And, and of course, you know, the, the parallels are fairly obvious with, with mothers that, that tend to hover over their kids. They tend to protect them. Uh, they pretend to, you know, they, they, they don't pretend. They, they do watch over them and care for them. And of course, the most fundamental aspect of, of mothers birthing a child. And, and that's what the Holy Spirit did in the creation of the cosmos. And so, so, so the parallels are very, very uh, evident. And so I think it's fitting as we honor our mothers today, as we uh, lift them up and we praise them and we, um, we do our best to just make them have a wonderful, wonderful day for bringing life to us. Uh, I think it's fitting to also talk about the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's uh, ministry in particular within worship. And so I encourage you, if, if you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 51 and verse 11. So and I'm going to talk about very quickly the, the differentiation between the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. And of course, this is by no means exhaustive. Uh, I could spend <laughs> a lot of time talking about the creative aspects of, of the Holy Spirit in the earth. I love what Psalm uh, 104 says, I believe it's verse 30, where it says, the Spirit of God renews the face of the earth. Every tree, every blade of grass, the springtime emergence 
of life on the earth in all of its facets. That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is actually active in that. The scripture says, in fact, Psalm 104 talks about the sustaining work of the Holy Spirit in feeding the animal kingdom. And it's just, it's fascinating, but I'm not going there, <laughs> at least not in depth. Where I am going is how the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament came on uh, three distinct offices, the offices of the, of the prophet, the priest, and the king. You know, we see this, obviously, you know, God anointing people like a Jeremiah or an Ezekiel, uh, you know, great prophets. God coming on someone like a, a King David, a, a, a King Saul. Um, and then the Lord moving in the midst of the priesthood. You think of the Aaronic priesthood. You think of the Levitical priesthood, how the Holy Spirit came down in the form of fire, uh, you know, in these sacrifices that were initially offered in the Levitical priesthood in, in the, the book of Leviticus. But what was interesting about that is the Holy Spirit came upon individuals in those specific offices. They were, they were as it were, anointed with oil, which was symbolic of the inner work of the Holy Spirit. But it came upon these individuals, but it could also depart from those individuals. I, I was just reading my own personal devotional today uh, in uh, Judges 16 on how the Holy Spirit had come upon Samson with his incredible, uh, you know, superhuman strength. And yet, <laughs> when he, uh, you know, he compromised with Delilah and told her the secret, the, the Nazarite vow that, hey, I, I you know, if, if my hair is shaved, I will lose my power. And, and that's exactly what happened. He revealed that secret to Delilah. And, and the haunting phrase in uh, Judges 16 is this, it says that Samson didn't know that the Spirit of God left him, his strength left him. And, and that, that is this idea of the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It was active. It was very powerful in the lives of individuals, but it came on individuals as they, as, as they walked within that office. Um, but, but in particular, if they disobeyed the Lord, if they sinned, the, there was the very real prospect that the Holy Spirit would be removed from them. And this is exactly what we see in Psalm 51 in the life of David after his sin, uh, committing adultery with Bathsheba and then having her husband killed and then lying about it. And, and Psalm 51 is written after he was confronted uh, with his sin by the prophet Nathan and he repented. But Psalm 51 gives us a glimpse into his heart and mind uh, as he reflected on that terrible, terrible, well, those terrible sins. And this is what he says in Psalm 51, verse 11, reflecting on his loss of fellowship with the Lord as a result of that. He said this, he said, do not cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. And so David was reflecting a very real Old Testament truth that the Holy Spirit that empowered him, that anointed him to be the king, to rule, to rule with wisdom uh, under, under the governance and, and the lordship of, of, of Yahweh, he could lose that very manifest presence of the Holy Spirit. And so that's a very sobering thing. But if you move to the New Testament, we see that the Holy Spirit does not just come upon individuals in Christ, but the Holy Spirit dwells within them. And that was a very um, um, important distinction. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to look at John, the 14th chapter and verses 16 through 17. And this is Jesus speaking again, shortly before he died. And he says this, he says, and I will ask the father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. Again, that's very, very important and very different than the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament is that the Spirit of God was going to live within the believer and never leave them. And that is so, so powerful. Um, and, the, and, and we see a glimpse of this. In fact, we can see glimpses of the New Testament in the Old Testament. Um, if you look at Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, and uh, verses 33 to 34, God, it says that God is going to write his laws into the hearts and minds of the, the, well, the Jews. But again, this was a preview of the messianic rule of Jesus. But more specifically, we see this shift in the ministry of the Holy Spirit through what Ezekiel says in Ezekiel's 36 
verses 26 to 27, he says this, he says, a new heart will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. There's that distinction. A new spirit I will put within you and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my ordinances and do them. And so part of this prophecy is speaking of, it's messianic. It's speaking of the church age. It's speaking of us as New Testament believers that the spirit of God is dwelling within us. But that begs the question that many Christians ask. If the Holy Spirit is in me, if the Holy Spirit is never leaving me, how come sometimes I don't sense him? How come I don't sense his presence in my life? And, and, and what we understand from scripture is praise and worship is a, a gateway, if you will, that opens up our lives to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's already in us, he hasn't left us, but many times we don't sense him. But, but what, what helps us to sense him, what helps us to experience his presence in our lives in a very real and tangible way, and I must say not just upon our lives, but upon our everyday lives, our work life, our home life, in all that we are and all that we do, it's praise and worship. So I encourage you to look at Psalm 22 and verse 3. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. It simply says this, speaking of God, you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Uh, the, the King James Version says, you inhabit the praises of Israel. And, and what that refers to is whenever we exalt God, we talked about this last week, the four different words for, for praise and, and exalting God in, in Psalm 100 verse 4. Whenever we begin to do that and begin to lift up the Lord in song and begin to praise him in song, whether corporately or individually, um, suddenly now we open ourselves up to the manifestation of God's presence and his kingdom power uh, because, again, we're, we're opening ourselves up to him and we're saying, God, please come, we receive you. And so what praise and worship does is it puts us in a position to receive more for the Lord, from the Lord. God, God is already here. The Holy Spirit already dwells inside of us. But uh, praise begins to prepare a specific and present place for God among his people. It's almost as if we are creating a throne, a place for God to come and dwell within us. And we begin to experience his presence in a very real way. Or if you prefer, and I like this, this um, reference, is that praise is an entry point for the kingdom of God to come. So as we exalt God and praise him in song and, and worship him with all of our heart and lift up our hands and revere him or, or go to our knees and begin to, to exalt him, we are basically saying, God, your will be done in my life. Your will be done in this corporate gathering of believers. Your will be done in this room. Uh, your will be done in this cubicle at work. Your will be done in the office spaces at my workplace. Your will to be done in the cafeteria uh, at, at the school that I work at or the school that I go to. I, I, I want you. I want you to begin to come and, and move. And so, so worship is the key to fully entering into God's presence. He's already there. He's already with us. But for our sensing him, in a powerful way, worship begins to prepare us for that. And again, the, the idea is that praises begin to release God's glory and they begin to usher us into what they call, theologians call this, the actualized responses of his kingly reign. So, so as, as God inhabits the praises of his people, we worship him. And God's presence begins to come into our room, into our setting. We begin to sense his peace. We begin to sense his, 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 his presence and, and, and the joy and the, the refreshing that comes from the presence of the Lord. It's not unusual for God's people in those moments to experience, again, what they call the actualized response of God's kingly reign in the form of prophecy, in the form of healings in the form of miracles, in a call to reverential silence and awe. 
I mean, there have been times uh, in my life where I've been in the presence of the Lord, and the best way I can say it is God has arrested my attention. <laughs> in other words, you know, you're distracted, you're thinking about stuff. Gosh, I got to do this. I got this to-do list. I don't know if, I, if, if you're like me, I've always got this to-do list in my head. And then when I begin to worship God and God's presence begins to come into the room uh, in, in an early morning setting, at least for my sake, suddenly now my attention has suddenly been captured. And all of those distractions, all of those that to-do list, all of that fades in the background. And God arrests my attention and I'm filled with awe and I'm filled with reverence. And oftentimes I fall on my face and I don't say anything and I just rest in his presence. That's what worship does. Again, that's the actualized response of God's kingly reign. What else? What else happens? You know, miracles, healings, awe, reverence. How about the conviction of sin? <laughs> Sometimes people get saved in the midst of worship. Uh, worship can be a very powerful apologetic for non-believing people who see the effects of the actualized reign of God in the lives of people on people's faces. Sometimes people are weepy. Sometimes people are broken for the Lord, and suddenly an unbeliever is going, what in the world is going on? Now, <laughs> for them, it might seem weird. It's definitely otherworldly, but it reveals a tr the transcendent realm of God that is different than this worldly realm, and it's an apologetic. It communicates that this God that all these people are worshiping is really real. He's really doing something, and it could cause the, the sinner to be convicted and say, listen, I want that. I want that. I want what God is doing in people's lives. I don't necessarily understand it, but, but, but I want it. Now, let me say this as well, is, is praise and worship doesn't manipulate God to force him to do something for you. That, 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 that's, not tr that, that's not what's going on. But what, what worship does is we begin to align ourselves with this great kingdom truth. And it's simply this, is that God's, God's got all the power. God is the power. But our responsibility or our privilege is to welcome him into our world. And, and you know, what worship in, in song does is we're saying, God, I want you in my world. <laughs> I've had enough of my world all week long. I've had enough of my worrying and enough of my fears and enough of my anxieties and enough of my anger and whatever else we deal with, right? It's like, no, God, I want you. I want your world. I want your kingdom. So that's why I'm going to worship you. That's why I'm going to praise you because I've had enough of life and living without you. I'm going to enter into your kingdom, into your realm. I'm going to, I'm going to open my heart and, and my life to you. And so you're, you're welcoming him into your world and, and, you know, uh, by implication into your marriage and into parenting your kids and balancing your checkbook and changing the diapers and going to work and going to get groceries. In other words, there's, there's inevitably, invariably a spillover. As the presence of God comes into our lives, as God inhabits the praises of his people and his kingdom begins to be actualized in our lives, it can't help but spill over. If nothing else, you'll look like you swallowed a floodlight. And people are going to ask you, what in the world is going on with you? How come you're so full of joy right now? And you could begin to tell them, listen, it's the God that I serve. And let me tell you about the worship that I just did. I just worshiped the Lord and, and God's presence touched me. And that's why I look like a swallowed a floodlight right now. Because his presence has been manifested, has been actualized in my life. And so it's important for us to realize that the Holy Spirit is, is ministering tangibly, powerfully, palpably during times of of worship is that God inhabits the praises of his people. And as we do that, we are saying, I welcome you, Holy Spirit. I welcome your presence. I welcome the actualized kingdom of God right here, right now in my life. And, and really the posture of praise and worship, it's a humble posture, isn't it? Because we are humbling ourselves. Again, in and of ourselves, we think, hey, I can figure this out. I can do it myself. I don't have time for God right now. I got too much to do. I don't, need, I don't, I don't have time to waste in God's presence. But when we begin to present ourselves before the Lord and humble ourselves and worship him and forget about our schedule, 
It, it's a humbling experience. But what begins to happen is we trade the trinkets of time for the essentials of eternity. And God begins to come and move in our lives. And listen, there's nothing on this earth that could replace that or transcend what God begins to do in, in, in times of praise and in times of worship. And so my desire and prayer for you this Mother's Day where we honor our mothers and rightfully so, let us also honor the Holy Spirit, the nurturing hovering, protective, creative, cleansing, sanctifying, convicting, refreshing presence of the Holy Spirit in worship. Let's not be spectators when it comes to times of gathered worship or worship within your own setting, but be active, be engaging. God, I lift up my hands. God, I fall on my knees. God, I praise you and I worship you knowing full well that when you do that, God inhabits those praises and God's presence and kingdom realities begin to uh, fill your life and begin to fill your heart and fill your mind. And, and again, what we talked about as we began this message is some Christians wrestle with, I don't sense God, I don't feel God. Where is God? Begin to worship him regardless of what you feel, regardless of your circumstance, regardless of what mood you're in. Begin to worship him Anyway, and I'm telling you, God will arrest your attention. Some of you need that. Some of you need your attention arrested by the Lord because you're dominated by your emotions. You're dominated by your feelings. You're dominated by your circumstances. And God wants to take you out of them and begin to bring you into his presence and into his life and into his refreshing. And I pray that for every single one of you. The Holy Spirit ministers during worship, but we've got to step out in faith and begin to worship him. But as we do, God inhabits our praises. So can we pray? Father God, I desire and pray that God, every single person that hears this message would become a worshiper, would truly be, be, become a worshiper of God. <laughs> We're all going to worship. And the problem is some of us have really bad gods. But my prayer is that for every single one of us, God, we would shift our attention to the living God and begin to serve him and begin to worship him and begin to lift up our hands and begin to sing songs of praise to him on a regular basis, actively engaging, not passive, but active. And Father God, I pray that God's Psalm 22, verse 3, would become a living, breathing reality in every one of our hearts, God, that you would inhabit our praises, and God, that the actualized kingdom of God would begin to manifest itself in hearts and lives, in families and marriages, I pray. God, miracles, healings, conviction of sin, a sense of of awe and reverence, arrested attention, God, salvations. Father God, I pray this in Jesus' name. Psalm 22, verse 3. Lord, let it be realized in all of our hearts and our lives. And Father, I pray a special blessing upon all of the mothers out there, God. I pray, watch over them, protect them, Father God. And Father God, continue to give them the grace and the strength and the wisdom to be the parents that they need to be for their people, Father God, and for, for their families, Father God, and their kids. I pray this, and I pray special grace on family members, God, on moms that have perhaps little kids, Father God, and, and they're demanding a lot of attention, or, or moms that are dealing with problem children, God, and undergoing stress and different things of that nature. I pray, Holy Spirit, minister to them and give them what they need. Let them sense your presence. God, let the peace of God that passes all understanding guard their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, it was great to be with you. Happy Mother's Day. Stay open to the ministry of the Holy Spirit in worship. All right, I'll see you next week. Take care.